Uh, of course, when the people had the opportunity to engage questions of us, uh, I don't think there's any place here we can hide, is there? Uh, no, no, certainly, certainly not. You know, uh, I'm sorry, I, but I must uh, address this. I must stop and talk about our most recent election. Oh. Never have I seen such vehemence of that. I would be cautious, much General. It's only been a short time. Much, there's so much defamation of character, and our chief magistrate now, who's been called all sorts of things, he's been called a, a libertine, a callow rake, a, a moral bankrupt, and an orange-headed knave. Uh, and really, it's not fair. I mean, your hair isn't orange anymore. No longer. <laughs> Who the devil did you think I was talking about? <laughs> Uh, I'm completely thrown off now. I'm, I've lost uh, our place. Uh, well, our place, the people. our place is before the people, and I, I dare say I thank you all for being here with us tonight. We look forward to your curiosities and your questions, but I believe there need be some explanation of our particular stands, particularly upon the subject of the Constitution, uh, which uh, we recognize every year in the month of September, do we not? We do indeed, commemorating the day that uh, we in uh, Philadelphia signed the, uh, the uh, Constitution, rather, uh, 1787. Uh, I'm very often asked my opinion of the Constitution, and I will tell you I never expect to see perfect work from imperfect man. And there were many disagreements along the way. Uh, I uh, chiefly agreed with Dr. Franklin, but even he and I had a disagreement along the way. Uh, Dr. Franklin, about halfway through our deliberations, thought it uh, put forward the notion that we should uh, begin each day's session with, his, as he put it, a prayer to the Father of Light. I said it was no time to call for foreign aid. <laughs> I said it was likewise seem as if the convention were suddenly in trouble if we were suddenly resorting to prayer. But ultimately, we came to an agreement. And though there was a man, I don't think it was a man, Jack of us, who was completely satisfied with the document when we left that September day of 1787. We knew we had something we could work with. And, of course, um, my, uh, my work in the document, you might well know. Uh, anyone know uh, what I was renowned for accomplishing during that Constitutional Convention uh, in Philadelphia City, September 17 and 87? Have you heard? Anyone want to reply? Mark, beg your pardon? Thank you, sir. I was not even there. <laughs> I was not there. Indeed. I was spending five delightful years in La Belle France, uh, and when I returned, the work had already been accomplished, and as you will never forget, I'm sure, I begged of you to inform me, what did I miss? I had missed entirely the 80s. Entirely the 80s. I think, uh, to be more clear before the people, and I, I know perhaps the more comfortable for you to rise above them upon a somewhat monarchical dais. Not necessarily. Uh, you come from the, the uh, background of largesse. I come from simple roots. Well, perhaps in, in any respect we should ascend the dais, although I dare say were we to do so from our positions at present, it might not be proper regarding our political no. platform. Why, why the devil is that? Because uh, for the audience, I am standing on their right. <laughs> ah, I see. I see. So you, yes, you should be on the left and I should be on the right. General? Ah, very good. Thank you. <laughs> well. Ah, we were discussing the Constitution and its uh, necessity. I think perhaps we ought to provide an introduction. Certainly, if you feel it necessary. Hmm. As is your custom, you have already begun. Uh, I am sorry, Mr. Jefferson. Would you like to begin? Thank you. My name is Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, your humble and obedient servant. My pleasure. And my compatriot, rest you assured, though with difference of opinion, we have stood together, particularly during our American Revolution. And I hope that you all may lead this evening as we expose our differences of opinion, hear your own concerns as well, that you will realize we know ourselves as Americans. General Alexander Hamilton, and we know that a difference of opinion ought never be a difference of principle. Indeed. Thank you, sir. I shall take the chair, and you may commence then in the reflections of that constitutional convention and the, the document itself. Well, thank you. Uh, now, who can tell me what was the name of the uh, government we had before the war, or during the war, rather? 
Uh, it was monarchy before the war, of course. Sorry? Articles of Confederation. Articles of Confederation are completely untenable, completely unefficacious, uh, a horrible, uh, crippling document that took away rights that we had previously established in a document that uh, uh, preceded that, that established our uh, eminence as a nation, our national sovereignty, our uh, ability to make treaties, collect taxes, uh, fight wars, and that document was the Declaration of Independence written by Thomas Jefferson. Which, if you will allow, His Excellency President Washington referred to as our promise. And consequently, the accomplishment of our Constitution as its guarantee. I think it ought to be known, firstly, that I was not in favor, so much in favor of the Constitution. As I set forth for France, I knew that there would be an effort to strengthen uh, the Articles of Confederation. But I thought the Articles of Confederation were a venerable fabric. They ought not to be tampered with. I will not deny there was a weakness in the method of electing the chief magistrate. Uh, there was a weakness in the method of collecting a general taxation for the defense of our nation. Uh, there was a weakness throughout the whole document. Uh, what were some of the difficulties of the articles? You must remember. We were, we were all there, yes? Sorry? Why is that? It needed more than that. It needed uh, almost uh, every single state had to vote yes in order for any law to pass into effect. Uh, and usually one state would hold out, and usually that state, Rhode Island. Mm. <laughs> yes, uh, other troubles of the Articles of Confederation. Someone spoke. Taxation. taxation. It was just a legislature. There was no executive. There was no judiciary. A legislature that did not even have the power to collect its own taxes. Taxes in those days were all collected by the individual states, I suppose you know, and then passed on to the federal government, right? I, know, I think you know how that worked. The states would collect the taxes, they would use what they needed, and then before passing it on to the federal government, they'd look about and say, oh, you know, there's a bridge that needs mending over here, the streets need recobbling, oh, the ports are a mess. Well, by the time the states had done with it, there was rarely anything left to pass on to the federal government. It was completely an unfit in a, fit, a completely inefficient document, uh, you couldn't spend, you, we had no standardized currency. You couldn't spend New, uh, New Jersey money in Pennsylvania or Pennsylvania money in New Jersey, even though they're just across the river from each other. It, were, it was absolutely a mess. At that time, I came to know in the Confederational Congress in 1783, I came to work with a, a young man, uh, James Madison, and that time, James Madison and I saw eye to eye. Well, literally, he, he's just a bit shorter than I am. <laughs> and Madison and I knew we could no longer operate under the Articles of Confederation. He spoke out against it as the anarchy of our system. It worked so poorly that in 1787 we had to meet to form that new government. Now, uh, once we had signed the document, then we had a new government, yes? Mm. No. No, you see, we hadn't actually been sent to Philadelphia to create a new government, but only to amend the Articles of Confederation. Many thought that we had overstepped our uh, authority, and to be honest, they might be right. But we went home with a resolution to each of us enjoin our individual states to ratify the document. And ultimately, after many labors, some Herculean on uh, Mr. Madison and my part, we were able to do so. Uh, I wrote a series of articles for the newspapers in those days, uh, which came to be known as the Federalist Papers. Uh, I, myself, John Jay and uh, James Madison, though he won't own it, I understand, though he did write a very long diatribe clearly outlining the essence of all of the uh, Federalist Papers, but uh, he will not own that he did so. The Federalist uh, we all adopted papers, the pen name of Publius. Generally, if you would allow the Federalist Papers, of course, purported the, the strengthening of the federal government. It purported the necessity and purposes of various departments uh, of this new government and the Constitution. But the Federalist Papers lacked the, uh, well, the purporting, the proffering of a particular reconciliation that followed that process of ratification. I've noticed you have not brought it to the forefront in referring to the history. I'm, I'm I mentioned that I was not at the Constitutional Convention. I was 3,000 miles away. I continued in correspondence with Mr. Madison. I declare the most luminous mind I've ever known, who knows more about ancient history, what has gone wrong 
in the past, what has become a profit and a, a beneficence to a people and ought to be utilized in modern governments. And so in that correspondence, I must say, it was Madison who began to convince me of the necessity of this Constitution. And I will never forget the draft that he sent me, the first draft, uh, after somewhat of a reconciliation of all there and the various plans that had been proposed. I wrote back to him, I'm captivated by it. Captivated by this new Constitution. It's the shortest document of its kind in human history, creating a government to check its own power. The most remarkable first line of any system of government in human history, which begins simply, we the people and there's the crux of the matter. That is our identity as Americans relevant to our government than a people have ever experienced before. That is the essence of the American experiment. Who are we the people or who is? Now then, of the three branches, which branch is the most powerful and influential? No, the judicial, I beg your pardon, I should certainly hope not. <laughs> Oh, good heavens. I'm with you there. A board of appointment, sir? I might remind you where are the laws made. Thank you. The legislative body. Have you been speaking with my cousin, Chief Justice John Marshall? <laughs> he would like to think his opinion could become law. Oh, but I doubt it, sir. I no, doubt I'd like it to indeed. cut that young man's jib. Yes, you are. <laughs> The legislative body. Now, citizens, the point of the matter that I replied to Mr. Madison, which is essential we do not forget, particularly as a result of the first line, read the people, is the fact that the document, the Constitution itself, can be read by any government in power for its own particular means and ends. It would thereby ignore the opinion of whom? Thank you. I wrote to Mr. Madison, what the Constitution needs is what all people upon this globe are entitled to. It needs a, a Bill of Rights. Absolutely unnecessary. You see? Absolutely yeah. unnecessary. Was there and not I a method to his madness to ignore the mentioning of the Bill of Rights? Thank you, citizens, for allowing me the opportunity. Uh, the, the, in Continue. the Bill of Rights is absolutely unnecessary. It, a Bill of Rights is unnecessary, and I go further. Uh, I will say that it is even dangerous, for uh, a, a Bill of Rights will contain various exceptions to those powers not granted, and on that very account would afford a colorable pretext to claim more than were granted. For why declare those things shall not be done, which there is no power to do? There it is. There you hear it. Do you see what he's trying to do? He is trying to hide the necessity for being so bold to pronounce these rights. This is what Madison was concerned about. I would not deny it. Do you recall, James Madison wrote me after I said a Bill of Rights is necessary and said, these rights are all inferred in the Constitution. There's no necessity of purporting them boldly. Now, what worried him is what worried General Hamilton. Do you know what it is? Why mention? Because once you mention them, the argument begins. But is that not what it ought to be? The public conversation, the argument of the citizen body. Are we to rest upon inference on such an important subject as the inherent rights of man? We were born free to declare, and therefore we must declare what are the inherent rights of man. But if we limit those rights in a document, then we imply the government has right to limit those rights and more rights besides. We are setting a legal precedent and establishing that legal precedent in our government. We, uh, the Constitution is all we need. The preamble to the Constitution is eminently a, a, a Bill of Rights in itself and absolutely unnecessary for us to have in one. No, uh, General, you know well with the pronouncement so boldly of the First Amendment, pronouncing the greatest of our inherent rights, rights we must never forget, given to mankind, not by any ruler, not by any government, but rights given to us by nature and nature's God, is that right in essentially to hold an opinion freely and to freely express one's opinion, particularly in matters of religion, particularly in a free assembly of people to argue the differences of opinion, particularly the liberty and freedom of the press. And then accordingly following from that, the protection, safety of defense, of the right of the people to bear arms for their self-defense and to form a well-regulated militia. And if anyone gets the wrong idea, a militia is not legal. 
unless it is commissioned by the government. And so it follows. And you've heard the general concern that it might continue to follow and follow and follow and follow. Well, of course it should. We should never think to go back to the ages of the darkest ignorance to find the greatest enlightenment or that anything that was created in the past cannot be improved upon in the present or the future. It is common sense, is it not? A child of 14 cannot wear the same clothes at the age of 40. Our laws and institutions must grow as we grow as a people. And so what does a Bill of Rights allow? It allows for our Constitution to grow and amend itself accordingly. That, with the stability of its inception and the original document, allows it to be relevant. Constitutions should, should be permanent. And uh, constitutions should be very general and should be permanent. Uh, because they cannot uh, foresee all the variable circumstances that could come to pass. So we need to have a very good general document. And it is, we have all that is necessary within the scope of the Constitution itself. We have the three branches, one to counter the other. And we have all the rights that we have. If it does not say in the Constitution that we do not have a right, then of course we have that right. And by delineating and establishing limits on those rights, we establish the government's precedent and right to limit those further. And you will have more amendments and more amendments that will make it worse. Oh, look now at we this. have the three branches of government. The, the judiciary, the executive, and the legislative, one to counter the other. It is inconceivable that one branch could grow so overpowerful, it could overmatch the other two. That is good government. A limitation of rights. Well, there you are. That's the march of civilization, is it not? Hardly, citizens, hardly. What you are hearing here is purporting that the Constitution ought to be simply what it is, stale and stagnate. Not necessarily stagnate, there's something, a document we can work with. Yes, and we can work with it when we can make it malleable to grow with us as a people. Indeed, it is something that lives and breathes. Are not laws living and breathing? But of course they are. They are not stagnant and stay where they are. The essence of the English law is that it evolves with the experience of the English-speaking peoples. I consider it the finest system of law upon the globe, the most pure, many have said, well, then Mr. Jefferson. And you've been amongst the coterie. Uh, if you think so, well, then why did you all go to war with Great Britain citizens? We did not go to war against the English law. We went to war because the English law would not accept the American experience in its evolution. But it is the law that we have inherited. It is the foundation of our Constitution and our jurisprudence. Let it continue to live and breathe as we do as Americans. I will grant you that we may make certain amendations as they become necessary. I can think of many that we might need to make in the near future, but we must hold to a general document. You know, one of the things I've heard that people want to change is the Electoral College, and I, I think that uh, a great uh, mistake. I think it's absolutely imperative that we have an Electoral College. The people have their voice through their elected representatives in the House of Representatives. The people do not have their voice through the electoral system of, the, of, of electing the President of the United States. No, no, but they don't have their, have their well, they voice. Have their, their voice. They, they elect their uh, delegates who elect their elect. Well, they, they, each of the states has it. Now, here's something, though. Each of the states has their own different method for electing those delegates. I guess that, I think, could need amending. Do you see the twistification? Almost like, indeed, a magician with smoke and mirrors, so that you can hardly follow the, the sequence of common sense upon the matter. He suggests that the system of electing the present, the electoral system, represents the opinion of the people. Nay, it does not, but a few citizens. Sorry, you misunderstood. The people have their voice in this nation through their elected representatives in the House of Representatives, and that's as it ought to be. And that's where it should end. Not it should not through elect that the president. system, General. You are well aware of the fact. That is the great conundrum of the first line of our Constitution. We the people who in this room, as the General and I would recognize, do not have a vote or a voice in our government. Who are you? The women folk. Those younger, tw 21 years. No vote, no voice. Others? The ins not only the enslaved but anyone of color. A mulatto, the natives of this land, one of a particular hue from a foreign land who has every right to come here and better their condition, they have no vote, no voice. Others? 
A white male 21 years of age in this room who does not hold property. You do not have a vote. You do not have a voice. Others? A white male in this room who holds property but is mortgaged does not have a vote or a voice. And imagine, your creditor may be a wealthy woman of color. <laughs> Despite her wealth, she has no vote, no voice any more than you do. It is only the white male freeholder who represents we the people and who is indeed protected, defended, bolstered by this method of electing the president of the United States. As I have said, that method of electing the president, the electoral system does not properly enounce the voice of the people. And someday it may become a blot on our constitution which will make its hit. It only serves to protect two elements of property for gentlemen of property. First, it protects the counting houses. Those small states, particularly in the north. And secondly, it protects the institution of the enslaved, who would know better than myself that delineation in our constitution of three fifths of an individual, there you have that protection of small states to large states, relevant to the alliance with the counting houses and the institution of slavery. Is that to continue? Or may our constitution someday? be the vehicle by, by which and through which it may be rectified to allow more directly the opinion of the people. So that the people may elect the president of these United States. Precisely. And if they can become the more educated, if we may achieve a universal system of education, helping the citizen body to understand the responsibility of citizenship and to eradicate slavery, to allow yes, indeed but the Mr. Farmers Jefferson, that is not true to fact. I ask you then, citizens, will there be any other necessity to maintain the electoral system. It is up to whom? The people to decide. Mr. Jefferson, I have heard you say that the, the voice of people is the voice of God. And also, as often as I have heard that said and said it quoted to be true, it is not true to fact. The people are variable and changing. They seldom judge or determine right. Uh, to, to trust uh, the people is to trust a great mob. Uh, look at what we have in Europe. Look at what has happened to our so-called sister republic of France. It went uh, early due to mob rule under the directorate, um, very far away from its uh, early goals, and then now it is in the hands of an emperor. Is that what we would like? No, we need men, learned men, men who statesmen, men of property, men who might have something to lose by electing some uh, uncontrollable individual, uh, and uh, men who actually might know the individual who's standing for office, mm -hmm. as opposed to a mob that can be swayed by some great demagogue. Well, there you are, citizens. You've heard it simply. The general certainly has a great faith in the people, or does he? A fear of mob rule, you want him to say, you heard him say, a distinct care and concern for only those gentlemen of education may be distinct and removed from the people. Now, I wish the general and I were standing here to pronounce something new and original. As many of you know who have read the elementary books of public right, we do not. It was Aristotle millennia ago who purported that man is born with a dichotomous nature. He is born either to fear or to trust, his politics will take root and emanate. And what you have seen before you here is someone who stands upon the principles that you all may read in the Leviathan, that work of Mr. Hobbes well over a century and a half ago, which purports that the essential nature of man is deceitful and corrupt, and therefore strong and central governments are necessary to control and direct. Happily, citizens, as I stand on your left, I have read my John Locke, his essays on government, volumes one and two, his essay on human understanding, his regard for the essential nature of man as being beneficent and open and trusting. The essence of it is simply that man's essential nature is to do good. For I ask you, sir, it is a jealous sentiment. How do you feel when you do good? Uh, well, this gentleman isn't going to answer. Perhaps you will. <laughs> you feel good. Uh, Mr. Jefferson. What would the people prefer? 
the advice of a Mr. Locke to purport that government governs best which governs least, a greater opportunity to do good, or the advice of Mr. Hobbes, a strong and central government without a faith in the people themselves. Mr. Jefferson, it was David Hume who said, every man ought to be considered a knave and have his own self-interest at the forefront. And if you have any sort of political ideas other than that, you are being nothing but naive. Yeah, I'm very often asked why I feel we need such a strong federal government. If I can, I would like to take you back to the war. Uh, we had occasion to retreat through New Jersey. Now, retreating is a dismal business at best, but there is no more dismal place to retreat through than New Jersey. <laughs> I see you've been. Uh, on the retreat through New Jersey, I, I would walk alongside the cannon, and I would pat the cannon as I would walk along, absorbed in thought, and I couldn't help but notice the tracks in front of me, the, the wagon wheels, uh, the hoof prints of the horses, and the footprints of the men. Very often shod, but very often like as not unshod. You know, cold goes through leather like that, and once leather becomes completely saturated to permeate due to inclement weather, it becomes very dry and brittle, and the men would try to tie the shoes on the feet with rags and scraps, but ultimately they would fall away. And we would be looking at bare footprints in the snow and the muck and the mire. And then of course, because skin itself is nothing more than leather, that too would begin to crack and open up. And we would be looking at bloody footprints in the snow and the muck and the mire. And we saw it all throughout the war. We saw it in the retreat through New Jersey. We saw it at Morristown. We saw it at Valley Forge. I began to ask myself, why have we come to such desperate straits? Why is there no proper sustenance for our troops? Men give me some credit for genius. All the genius I have lies in this. When I have a subject in hand, my mind becomes pervaded by it. Day and night it is before me. I plumb the problem to its very depths. Then the results of my reflection, some men are pleased to call the fruit of genius. It is not. It is the fruit of labor and thought. And when I plumb this problem to its depth, what was the result? The trouble was the government we had at the time. The Articles of Confederation, a weak, feeble, crippling document that took away rights. We had already established for ourselves a national sovereignty in the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence. A weak feeble executive, no executive, weak, feeble government that could not properly support our troops, our army, the men who were fighting and dying in these wars. Sorry, that got my dander right up. I beg your pardon, General, but it is not the, the denial nor the support, indeed, of that federal government that I am referring to. I am referring to the federal government being in the hands but a few who care to strengthen it for their own particular purposes their own alliances, if you will, with gentry, aristocracy. My purpose to stand here with you is to provide for the people the better understanding that this document ought to remain in their hands. I cannot help but think that as, uh, as we have continued to disagree over the necessity of uh, allowing a deficit of spending to occur and accrue over years, as we've continued to degree, uh, disagree over the necessity of a national bank, that both of these, in the hands of a federal system presided over by a few, will allow it not to be amended by the people themselves. The and people it have help their but voice. Then Festa. Explain to them then. People your, have your their right. voice through their elected representatives in the House of Representatives. This is appropriate. We do not live in a democracy. If every voice were a, a, a Socrates in ancient Athens, uh, all, if they all cry at once, it is nothing but cacophony and anarchy. No, we must be a republic. We must not have anarchy. They, we've seen what's happened in France with anarchy. Hmm. No, we cannot have that. Uh, we have a, let us take, for example, let us take, for example, the bank. The bank. The bank. In the, Mr. Jefferson has a, a disagreement with me. I said we ought to have a bank. Mr. Jefferson says we ought not to have a bank. Uh, and why should we not have a bank, Mr. Jefferson? Very simply because the people know as well as you do there is no mention of it in our Constitution. The subject ah, but there began are so this evening as our well Constitution. As, and he there suggests implied, as well as express powers written in the Constitution. The National Bank is implied in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution states that the Congress may make all, any laws necessary and proper for carrying into effect the listed powers. If a bank is necessary, then we can build a bank. Did you hear or feel that wind that just has pervaded this room? 
And then the, the wind that came out of the mouth of General Hamilton, who assumes that our Constitution is like a ship at sea and therefore billows with canvas into which you may blow wind to set it forth in the future. Hardly. Yes, there is no mention of a national bank in our Constitution. There is not even the inference of it. It's been conjured up by General Hamilton and his cronies in the counting houses. Let me give the, you an example. Something that we actually agreed on, Jefferson. Uh, years ago, I thought it was absolutely necessary, and then later when I became Secretary of the Treasury, I brought into being a revenue cutter service. Uh, and you uh, recommended as well. That Militia we have, boats for the defense of our coastline. Right, yes. to guard our coast. Uh, uh, as Secretary of the Treasury, it became my job to uh, put duties on goods coming into this country, you know, all sorts of things, really. Uh, French linen, French brandies, French wines. Not that I've got anything against the French, but to, uh, to put duties on those goods coming into this country. And there were many who sought to avoid paying those duties and wanted to smuggle them to our shores. Now, uh, we, to that end, I created that series of revenue cutters to keep that from happening, also to help us from uh, uh, prevent uh, the depredations of uh, uh, piracy. But at the same time, I was ordered to that same end to build a series of lighthouses by the Congress, because it was necessary. Now, we've all read the Constitution. We all know the Constitution. We all know nowhere in does it say anything about a lighthouse, and yet it became necessary to build them. Fair if enough, we can yeah. build a lighthouse, we can build a bank. A national bank is not likened unto a beacon light. Oh, a I beacon think it light is. only for a few I think it is. Yes, but of course you would think it is. Explain to the people, if you will, the deficit of spending which has been incurred upon us as a result of the revolution and how you've conjured up this idea of a national bank in order to administer the paying off of the national debt. And then if you will allow me, after I've sat back and borne witness once more to this travesty, I shall stand before the people and provide my opinion. Uh, very good. Well, we were $80 million in debt. 80 million you citizens. Can, can you imagine such a sum? $80 million in debt. Now, my system of finance for handling the debt was, first, assumption of the debt. We'll come back to that. Second, take the debt, convert it into interest-bearing bonds, and sell the bonds on the open market, as we have every right to do. And who and are the only ones who can afford to purchase these bonds? Anyone who has the capital. Uh, third, the establishment of a national bank, as we have every right to do. Uh, and who are the ones who can afford to purchase 51% of the shares of our nation's national bank open to the public? 51% is owned by the government. 51% no. of the bank yes, the is owned of by Congress the government who have first opportunity and under the to directors the of the bank. What a travesty. Uh, so, uh, uh, but, uh, as I said before, this, let's go back to the assumption of the debt, if we may. We were $80 million in debt. Now, it was absolutely imperative that we establish a national credit. At the, prior to that time, all the individual states had their own uh, dealings with the foreign powers, uh, different banks in Europe that they were borrowing money from. Uh, some of those states had paid those debts back, and some of them had not. Um, states such as uh, North Carolina uh, didn't want to help any other states pay back their debt. They had already paid their debts. Uh, Virginia, and to be honest, New York. Uh, it's as if, I wonder if I might enjoin the help of a few of you here. Oh, here he goes again, just Let like he did in see. Congress. Now, uh, young fellow, would you stand for a moment? Uh, could you st step right, right up here? Uh, what's your name? My name's Sam. Sam. Everyone say hello, Sam. Hello, hello Sam. Sam, I would like you to represent the state of North Carolina. Would you do that for me? <laughs> Standing like a North Carolinian. Well done. All right, everyone say hello, North Carolina. Hello, North Carolina. Now, North Carolina, you paid your debts for the war. Do you want to help any other states pay their debts? No. No, no that's, that's, uh, that's the way North Carolina put it, too. All right, uh, I need another one of you, if I may. Uh, young lady, would you come up here as well? Uh, very good. Uh, what's your name? Emmy. Emmy? Yes. Uh, everyone say hello, Emmy. Emmy. Uh, Emmy, I would like you to stand for the state of Massachusetts. Would you do that? It seems kind of small. It is? Oh, but, but they're resilient. Uh, and loud, if you take Adams as an example. All right, so Emmy, uh, you're going to be Massachusetts. Uh, uh, say hello, Massachusetts. Hello, Massachusetts. Now, Massachusetts, you've accrued a great deal of debt from the war. Would you like North Carolina to help you pay that debt? 
Yes. All right. So North Carolina, I hope I don't put words in your mouth. Uh, uh, Massachusetts would like you to help pay that debt. What would you say to that? I would say no. <laughs> Says no. Uh, it's politics, so you're actually going to have to provide some sort of reason. Oh, man. Hmm. Well, I already paid a ton of money for the war. Yes. Yes, you did. And I'm, 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 I, I am my own state, so I'm going to need to keep, I need, I'm going to need to have all my money for my own taxes, my own laws. And there you have it. Can you nope. imagine if our Constitution began, we the states? Yeah. I think you might be making a better argument than North Carolina did in the day. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, Massachusetts, that's uh, what North Carolina has to say. He says he's got his own taxes, he's got his own problems, he's paid his debt for the war. What do you say? I've got my own problems and I need help. <laughs> my people fought for his people and now my people need his money. Oh, your people fought for his people? Well, Don't how, encourage it, Hamilton. Don't how, encourage it. How do you it. mean that? <laughs> Oh, this is great. Hey, well, you, listen, you do not want the masking next to have the vote, do you? <laughs> uh, all right, uh, yep, uh, please uh, g carry on. Well, you see, you told us that we all had to in unite and to fight against the mother country. And so to do that, we had to become friends. And so not very willingly, we did. But... Now it's time for everyone to come back together and to share, which they're not doing very well. I mean, you're brilliant. Uh, all right. That's a tough act to follow, but uh, carry on, North Carolina. Well, some states aren't really friends with each other, though. That's, that's true. How do you mean that? Politics. Tell me about it. <laughs> all right, uh, but why? She's saying we've all fought together. We're all on the same side. You should help her out. What do you say? Yeah, I guess that kind of does make sense. It does make sense. I'll tell you what North Carolina said in the day. No, but <laughs> but let me ask you a question. Uh, since she brought up the fighting, uh, when did you start fighting the war? Yes, no, 1776, uh, Declaration of Independence, nominally, we're all in this together. But uh, when did you really start fighting the battles? Hmm. 1780. 1780. 1780, well answered. Very good. Now, uh, Massachusetts, when did you start fighting the war? Way before that. Like, what year? 1775, April 19th, 1775, the shots, first shots broke out, Lexington and Concord. 1775, 1780, five years longer, Massachusetts has borne the brunt of this war. The public debt is the price of liberty and as such has a special claim upon the public purse. Could you come in a bit? We all collectively have benefited from the revolution, yes? Yes then there is a collective responsibility to that debt. Is there not? No, there, there is. There is a you still sound like North Carolina. Well done. <laughs> Typecasting. Yes. All right. Thank them uh, by giving them a round of applause. Well done. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Very uh, well uh, argued. Miss Heavy. No, oh, sorry. Oh. Not sir. Uh, Mr. Sir, Jefferson wants you back. North Carolina, You're you not do done. not sorry. think that I am going to allow Hamilton to get away so easily. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on your side, Massachusetts. <laughs> now then, I certainly appreciate what I have heard from both of you, because at the essence you have recognized our collaboration, that we work together to protect and defend ourselves as a union of states and commonwealths. Remember what stupefied our mother country, Great Britain, let alone the rest of the world. England wanting to keep us separate as if we were unruly children, slapping our wrists to keep them in separate rooms. No, what astounded them 
was the fact that we brought 13 individual nations together. Each one of those former colonies were nations unto themselves, different from one and the other in degree of religious opinion in one versus a vast difference in another. The degree of freeholders in one versus a greater number of tenants upon the free number of holders in another. We brought it together, e pluribus unum, through the founding principle of compromise and resolution. General Hamilton has proposed a certain compromise to pay the national debt. It is known as the Assumption Bill. He is assuming the debts, not only of Massachusetts and North Carolina, but our other 11 states. He's pulling this all together and making everyone responsible for paying it. You expected to pay the same as he will have to pay. Well, it's fair. Just a moment. <laughs> it's not fair. Be Britain pay? No, Britain's not going to pay for our war. They already did. The point of the matter is this. You can ill afford, Massachusetts can ill afford to pay what he can easily afford to match, if you will, this necessity and this proposed responsibility of all the states to pay the national debt. Now, hear my proposal. Yes, and it preceded his. The spring of 1784, our Congress was seated in Annapolis at the time. General Madison, uh, uh, Hamilton had retired. I was asked to consider writing a report on how the Northwest Territories could enter our nation as new states. We now own them outright. It was a five requisite uh, report that I provided. First and foremost, every territory becoming a state will forever remain a state of this union. Secondly, every territory becoming a state will have its government in Republican forms as the other states in the federal government. I'm going to skip to number four. No one holding any hereditary title will be admitted a citizen of the United States. And fifth, lastly, before I come back to number three, is that by the year 1800 of the Christian era, there shall no longer be any involuntary servitude in any of the states or the territories annexed to them. Now, I will mention number three in a moment, but I want you to know collectively those five requisites put up to vote lost by one vote. It is still said that the delegate from New Jersey was home ill that day. I wrote in correspondence, not to you, sir, on that day the heavens clouded over our nation and the destinies of unborn millions were made. In our Constitution, happily, we have set another date, 1807, when the Congress can vote once more and decide whether we will end the importation of slaves. However, number three of those requisites, the national debt will be apportioned on the states as they can afford to pay. Massachusetts can pay what she can and continue one year after the other. Sound good? Sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> North Carolina, no problem for you to pay that debt, is it? That's <laughs> right. You can get it over with immediately. Oh, yes. So, General, thank you for the opportunity that I can explain my plan, granted though it lost, but I go to the people in the proper democratic or Republican fashion, and I would like by show of hands, how many here now, having heard Hamilton's plan of assumption and my own plan of prorating the national debt, how many are more in favor of the assumption bill by a show of hands? How me many just... are more in favor of the prorating plan of Mr. Jefferson? Thank you. Now, Let's uh, allow our friends to return to their seats. I right? know you wanted them to return to their seats a lot earlier. Uh, no. Thank Let's you, Let's give them a round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I do want to say uh, that Jefferson has figured erroneously, but before I do, let me just say I have questioned many, many North Carolinas and Massachusetts, but never have they argued so well. Well done. Well, well done, done, Sam. Indeed. Indeed. Very well done. Well done. Uh, no, Mr. Jefferson, you have figured it erroneously, I believe. If, uh, if Massachusetts has a great deal of debt and North Carolina has paid their debts, they are overpaying, but it's still, it's appropriate and it's absolutely necessary uh, to use your plan would not 
establish our national credit, and it is absolutely imperative that we establish our national credit. We cannot trade as a nation if we do not have a national credit. And the assumption of the debt, the establishment of the National Bank, and the trading of, the, well, that's not necessary, but will establish our national credit. A point of your assumption, Bill, that I did indeed agree upon, that there must be the opportunity for us to establish trade with foreign nations, even if it may mean that they could invest in our particular debt as a security. However, I think it is time that we may hear the opinion of the people themselves, but not before we enlighten them, to where this disagreement ultimately found itself. Yes, I found myself... Uh, <laughs> I put this assumption bill forward, and then I found that my up until then friend, James Madison, had blocked the assumption bill in the House of Representatives, a perfidious desertion of the principles he had sworn to uphold. Mr. Madison was concerned that this was wont to divert the attention of what had become known as the Residency Act, the act deciding where our nation would place its federal city. Should it remain in New York? There in the center of commerce and urban markets, there among stock jobbers and speculators who would meet under the buttonwood tree, so close to the counting houses, and whether our nation's capital should be midway between the North and the South, below the line drawn by Mason, Messrs. Mason and Dixon, in the land predominantly settled by farmers, nine out of every ten Americans seated on farms. I the thought it a capital thing to put, well, the capital in uh, the city uh, where, that has the greatest commerce, and New York. For if, we look at the, if we look at the example of Europe, uh, the capital of France and its financial capital is Paris, uh, the capital of Great Britain and financial capital, London, they have shown great success in doing so. Why should we not emulate great success? Uh, but there were many s cities that were vied for the position of becoming. Uh, our capital city. Mm. Uh, there was uh, Philadelphia, of course, uh, New York, Trenton. Mm. It is so, but these are all urban centers. These are cities already established upon commerce and trade. Let us not forget nine every, every ten Americans, the average American, the common man, residing upon farms in their majority. And therefore, His Excellency, we should never forget, will we, General? General no, sir. George Washington, our president, called upon the two of us, called upon us to visit him there in the president's house. It was at the Bowling Green, the southern tip of Manhattan Island. I was residing uh, number 57 Maiden Lane, you but a block or so away. I was occupying Wall Street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why is that amusing? And so it was, you got to the president's house before me very early in the morning. I recall approaching you, sir, and almost immediately you hurled yourself upon me like a tiger of the female gender. You tried to I, convince me to accept the assumption bill even before His Excellency would hear our various points. It was absolutely necessary that we do so, and I enjoined you, not as some female tiger, but uh, I found myself vexed and I, I knew not where to turn. See, if one part of my financial plan fell through, the whole thing might collapse. And so it was absolutely necessary. And the first part, the assumption, was the most crucial part. And but so it we approached was, the general. We appeared before His Excellency. We explained in detail, as you have just heard, the Assumption Bill and the Residency Act. His Excellency sat there before us and then pronounced that he could not make up his mind. He was undecided. In order to help him, the more so, he asked of us that we enumerate right down distinctly our plans, our principles, and to submit him to it the very next day. And that we did, sir, did we not? We did indeed. And within another day, His Excellency gave us the same reply. He could not decide. The responsibility was now on our shoulders, that the two of us must decide, that indeed the the North and the South hung upon our shoulders the future of generations yet unborn as to how we might work this argument and debate and difference of opinion in resolution. I was the one who suggested that you, you come to a repast at my chambers, number 57, and you were so gracious to allow that I thought Mr. Madison should attend as well. Indeed. 
Our fledgling federal government faced serious danger in those days. Talk of secession, secession, I could speak earlier this evening, secession was rife both in the North and the South. And the tensions over the weakened economy and where the placement of the capital would be was dividing the nation. We must come to some sort of resolution. Then uh, Mr. Madison and I and Mr. Jefferson discussed the uh, notion and Mr. Madison agreed that if I would support uh, temporary capital in Philadelphia and to move the permanent capital to the banks of the Potomac, that he could possibly remove his obstructions to my, my assumption bill. And as well, the mighty little Madison suggested that I might follow in kind and influence many a delegate from the southern states and commonwealths to accept the assumption bill so long, General, as you would influence the delegates of the northern states to accept the Residency Act by placing our capital midway and below that line drawn by Messrs. Mason and Dixon. I dare say such a, a further collaboration as we have been wont to secure before succeeded to maintain our union, succeeded to provide a future still in the hands of the people that they might populate now to the West, that their capital would ever be midway to their attentions as they made their way either from North or South. And so therefore, again, I thank you for that successful collaboration. And I you, Mr. Jefferson, and I you. Now, you'd spoken before about throwing the floor open to some questions. Did you still, you still have a mind to do so? Absolutely. You said vox populi, vox dei, as the Romans did. The voice of the people is the voice of God. Their mm. nature will speak. That is not true to fact. Uh, but uh, let's have the first question. <laughs> so citizens, uh, the point. Yes. Could you explain more the Residency Act? I'm not sure that. The Residency Act called for the nation's capital, the federal city, to be situate midway between the northern states and commonwealths and the southern states and commonwealths. When I refer to commonwealths, of course, I'm referring to the commonwealth, only three that we had at that time, uh, shortly Kentucky would enter, but we had Massachusetts in the north, we had Virginia in the south, and we had Pennsylvania somewhat in the center or middle. But the Residency Act called for the capital to be below the line drawn by Messrs. Mason and Dixon between Pennsylvania and Maryland. That it be along a navigable waterway now, that could have been the Rappahannock, it could have been the Potomac, it could have been even the James uh, or the York River. But it was decided that it must be along a navigable waterway 100 miles removed from the ocean to be of sufficient safety, protection, and defense should any enemy uh, desire to enter into that waterway. It allows you uh, that time to prepare your retreat, all your preparations for defense. And, and this prescription has existed from time immemorial in prescribing the centers of commerce and the capitals of political economy to be placed at the fall lines. Because if you're overwhelmed by an attacking enemy, you can escape beyond the fall line and their navy can never follow. You can destroy any canal that might have been built about the fall line. So that is what the Residency Act called for and what became known and surveyed as the District of Columbia. Yes, sir. Could you all comment on the uh, dynamics of political competition during that period? During your period? Comment on the dynamics of political competition. Well, uh, I think you've seen some here this evening. I will warrant. Uh, uh, something else we agree on is Adams. Uh, neither one of us get along with him. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Adams was uh, referred to in the Jeffersonian press. He was called a. Uh, a hoary-headed incendiary. Uh, this is, of course, unprosecutable under the Sedition Act, as that is an entirely truthful statement. You're speaking about dynamics, sir, and I'm very curious about that, whether you're referring to an element of magnitude that must need the attention of geometrical mathematics. Uh, I, I wonder if you are not referring to the magnitude of the influence of news writers and newspapers. Mm -hmm. Salacious accusations? Well, you've already heard that Mr. Adams uh, was uh, demeaned in the press. He was also referred to uh, by the anti-federalist press uh, as the toothless wonder. A, a monkey just put into breeches. A hermaphrodite. And can you imagine, sir, for those who could not read, or if they could, would not allow themselves to read, this became their 
belief of fact. They took it merely by word, that which was written in mere tabloids. I was referred to, of course, as a lover of the French, ever interest to rape and pillage. I was referred to as uh, the keeper of a Congo harem. I was referred to as an atheist. You're not. Thank you. Um, no, I was questioning, actually. <laughs> but, sir, this is what the public will allow if they choose. And yet, sir, what is the, what is the alternative? To deny this to be printed in the press, as Mr. Adams' administration sought in the alien and sedition laws? That, sir, is distinctly unconstitutional, and I replied to it in the Kentucky resolutions, as Mr. Madison did in the Virginia resolutions. And, sir, when we think about the, the vagaries, if you will, the accusations of the press, and who should know more than myself? I'm the victim of most newspapers. <laughs> but were it left to me to decide whether we should have this nation with a government and no newspapers, or whether we should have this nation with newspapers and no government, I would not hesitate a moment but to accept the latter. Who must be the judge of what they read in the newspapers? The people. You are the judge of what you read. You are the ones who decide what newspaper you will peruse. And as I've written, what American citizen would ever seek to satisfy solely themselves by reading one newspaper that prints only what they want to read without reading the opposite opinion and then make up their mind for what is best for everyone? I wonder, Mr. Asia. Jefferson, that you decry against the press. Uh, you yourself uh, had Philip Verneau at the National Gazette, a State Department employee paid with State Department funds to produce a newspaper to attack the federal government. And you, uh, sir, uh, may I say, would want to support Mr. Fenno, did you not? I did indeed uh, add some, uh, but not government funds. I never paid one cent to a news writer. I have written that distinctly. Well, he, you had him there as a translator. He only speaks one other language. I think the Gazette and, uh, and indeed these newspapers well, are What about a calendar? That You're hoist with your own petard with that one. Keep going, Hamilton. <laughs> Citizens, I will tell you this, and in answer again, sir, to your question. I think history has already borne out. Wherever the press is free, the people will be free. Uh, we have a question over here. Yes. You have both repeatedly referred to the people. President Jefferson, you talked about the responsibilities of citizens. Yes. I wonder if you might address what you believe the citizens' responsibilities are in General Hamilton, if you would say that as well. well sir, the responsibility of the people is to question their government always. That is how I was brought up. I had the privilege of an education, the influence of a teacher I shall never forget, one Dr. William Small, whom when he welcomed all of the boys there in his classroom at the old Royal College of William and Mary, that first session I attended in the winter of 59 and 60, made statement to all of us, boys, bear in mind as we begin our lessons, man is only one generation removed from barbarism. If he forgets, he falls backward. And so began our study, sir, and I observed from him the elements of citizenship. First and foremost, he had gentlemanly and correct manners. Romans said, manners make the man. Is that any the less so in this modern world? That is the mark of a citizen, to show respect to their fellow citizens. We had a great respect for Dr. Small. It was by a very simple formula. Dr. Small had great respect for whom? His students. He realized each and every one of us is a new mind, never seen before upon this globe, ready to be provoked in the intellect, inspired in the imagination. Secondly, as I have written, he had an enlarged and a liberal mind. Good so, so, so. I made that statement the other day. A gentleman wagged his finger at me and said, Mr. Jefferson, do not become political. I said, I beg your pardon, sir. He said, well, you mentioned the word liberal. Yes, you heard correctly. Let us not forget its definition. It comes from the Latin word libertas, meaning Freedom, liberty, referring specifically, as I was, to education, the cultivation of the human mind, allowing the mind to remain free and open. That is well a requisite for citizenship. It is the mark of education, an educated citizen body, as Socrates cultivated 
enlightenment amongst his students under the shade of the tree in his garden. Realizing his students were, the, were well educated when they realized how much they did not know. And then what did he do? He placed the responsibility upon their shoulders that they had the privilege of an education to go forth and better the condition of mankind. Improve human society. You are the ones blessed with an education. Now do so. And thirdly, he had a happy talent for communication. He made learning an enjoyable adventure. Let not citizenship be such a somber responsibility that we forget the simple happiness and joy of accomplishing with our fellow citizens the improvement of our nation for the generations yet unborn. That is why, sir, in referring to my teacher, I think citizenship will be the better understood if we can have an educated citizen body and civics be a course of study. I would follow that by saying that in this I actually agree with Jefferson for the most part. Uh, I think that uh, men ought to educate themselves. If they find themselves uh, without the opportunities, well then they need to create those opportunities. I certainly did. Franklin did. Uh, Roger Sherman did found opportunities to pull themselves by, the, uh, by their own bootstraps. Uh, so I, I think there are ample opportunities, and, or if not, you create them. Uh, if you want to vote, I think you ought to vote, uh, but you must educate yourself in order to be able to vote. I find too many people vote without knowing enough, you know, and not knowing enough about your local representatives, for example. So when I decry against the, the mob, I'm decrying against the uneducated, the ones who do not want to better themselves, the ones who have no interest in uh, learning about uh, issues before voting. Perhaps you ought to move on to another question. Uh, the gentleman yonder on the aisle. Yes. Uh, we often, now that you guys disagree, we often hear about the disagreements between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Uh, but I was just wondering why in the election of 1800, when it came to a top tie, you decided to endorse Mr. Jefferson. Well, uh, thank you. And you're talking about uh, in the election of 1800, and Thomas Jefferson was uh, uh, running for president of the United States. Uh, there were three other candidates. And uh, there arose a tie in the Electoral College between him and Burr. Uh, 73 I, I, electoral votes each. All of the electoral votes had to be in Washington City by the first week in February. And can you imagine who opened the envelope to reveal it to the Senate, sir? <laughs> the President of the Senate, Vice President of the United States, and one of the candidates. And to reveal a tie, not between President Adams and another, but rather between two opposed to President Adams, one of them his own Vice President. 73 electoral votes each. How many times did uh, they have to, you went to the House of Representatives? Yes, well of course that's the whole point, you know, our Constitution, you were brilliant men, I must admit, Hamilton, brilliant men in that September of 87 in that convention. You understood the nature of mankind. You understood that this could very well happen in our system of uh, public election. And so it was prepared and written in our Constitution. Should this occur, a tie in a presidential election, in the electoral system, the election continues and it goes where? I'm delighted. I heard a young schoolboy the other day, without even hesitating a moment, a reply to the question, uh, it goes to the judiciary. Have you ever heard of anything more ridiculous in <laughs> your entire life? Not inappropriate, but... That involved. would give Marshall some fuel for an idea of judicial review, would it not? Absolutely no, it goes to the House elected by the people, and they voted. You're referring to the vote. They voted, and they voted, and they voted, and they voted. How well we remember, we can never forget. They voted, and they voted, and they voted, and they voted. 33 times without breaking the vote, the tie. Without breaking the tie, 33, and then they stopped. Gentlemen, some of us recognize that as a significant number. 33. Where do we go from here? What further work needs to be done? It's now entirely upon us. During that time, I then received a correspondence 
from this gentleman at the complete opposite end of the political spectrum from me. I will never forget the first line. I had the letter. You're welcome to see it should you visit at Monticello. The first line, Mr. Vice President, I'd consider you the least dangerous of the two candidates. <laughs> and then your reconciliation, well, sir. I am usually, when I speak, and I, I don't know why this always happens, but I'm usually cautioned uh, against Burr and uh, cautioned against dueling in the same sentence, and I'm not certain as to why. <laughs> I know it would be an extraordinary thing for you in your, your day and age that a vice president of the United States should shoot someone, but uh, in my day, uh, Burr was a, was a duelist, a duelist of some note, and uh, uh, if you want to ask me about that later, perhaps uh, uh, I can supply an answer. But uh, as to why, I supported Mr. Jefferson in that instance. Burr and I had a long association. Burr and I... Uh, we're in the military together. Uh, when we were cut off, uh, we were cut off by the Redcoats in New York. Uh, well, you know how the battles worked in and around New York? Brilliantly, if you were in the British Army, in the Continental Army, not too well at all. We had to retreat. Uh, the Redcoats cut us off, and we didn't know the way back to the rest of the army. Captain Burr led us back to the rest of the army. I was very glad to see Captain Burr that day. He's a, an attorney in New York. I'm an attorney in New, in New York. We've argued on opposite sides of cases. We've argued on the same sides of cases. I do not see much in substance in his arguments, more of a uh, liberal dexterity, if you will, but uh, uh, Burr and I have been on opposite sides of the political spectrum, but we have been associates for many years. He was an aide-de-camp to General Washington. I was an aide-de-camp to General Washington. I was with General for four years. He lasted less than a month. They didn't get on. Uh, and when it came to the election of 1800, well, let me give you an example. When uh, we were at war with France, General Washington was commander-in-chief of the army at that time, and Adams was president, and General Washington died. I, I think there's no man who had greater cause to lament his passing than myself. But I found myself as a second in command. I was then in command of the army, and in those days I was having trouble with the Congress, and uh, likewise with John Adams, but then who doesn't, you know? And I wrote to Burr, and mentioned that, and Burr wrote back to me, the Constitution is but a paper machine. You have it within your means to make yourself happy, meaning you have the military, you have the army, go in and take over the government. And I wrote back, that's absolutely reprehensible, we cannot do that sort of thing, the military must always be subservient to the civilian authority, and he wrote back to me, great men do not trifle over morsels. And that's the sort of man who could have been president of these United States. I found him a dangerous man. Before agreeing to support Jefferson, to ask some of our Federalist friends to support him, we did have an exchange. We talked uh, about some few points that we in the Federalist Party were concerned over. Uh, one was uh, we wanted uh, uh, you to remain neutral as to the belligerent powers in Europe, and you agreed that that was a, a good notion. And I think we've actually agreed on that uh, throughout. Uh, second was to, that you would continue to support and keep and gradually strengthen the Navy, and you thought that a capital notion as well. Uh, then uh, as well, you would retain our friends in office with, of course, uh, the exception of your own cabinet. And, uh, <laughs> and the fourth point's missing, uh, slipping my mind. We did something, we agreed on something else there. Uh, you, we asked for something else. Uh, uh, the army. Oh, the standing arm? No, you did. I don't think you gave me that I one. I suggested that I would ameliorate the difference of opinion, that I did not care for a standing army, but would accept it so long as it could be led by an enlightened officer. Corps, oh, you did indeed agree on that. Which on would a... allow me then to be elected president and within a short time to commission a military academy at the old fort at West Point. I can assure you, General, that with your letter, I accepted... Once more, that founding principle we pronounced several times this evening of our nation, a compromise and a resolution on behalf of the common good. Three votes later, the 36th ballot, the 17th day of February, 1801, the tie was broken and I became the third chief magistrate. In my inaugural address, March the 4th, 1801, I made st statement that we had just borne witness to the second American Revolution. It was as much a revolution over the principles of this nation as that of 76. We had overthrown our government once more. But let not the future nor the present generation forget the difference between the revolution of 76 and 1800. Anyone know? 
Exactly, sir. In 1800, not a firelock was read, raised, nor blood was shed in the peaceable transfer of government. Where has that ever happened in the midst of, of extreme political vitriol in the history of any nation? Extraordinary. Do you know when the British learned this? They printed a column in the London Journal. If this is true, then perhaps the American experiment of self-government will survive. Do we have time for more questions or... Oh, the young lad no, One more question. Yes, young fellow. Well, uh, what was the voting for the American bird? Uh, sorry? Uh, the voting for the American bird. The, the, uh, voting for the American bird. Yes, well, I, I think we've established that the national bird of this country is an eagle. We, we put it on many things. It's on our coins. It's on uh, the first national bank, that, which we have every right to have. Uh, uh, but then... <laughs> As I understand it, uh, Franklin wanted a turkey. <laughs> he said uh, I, uh, because it was an American bird, and he thought it a noble beast somehow. Mm -hmm. And wise and of sustenance unto those who had been settled for many generations. We cannot deny that. Uh, I wanted Columbia, Columbine, as known by the ancients, and we call it the dove a symbol of peace, a symbol of harmony, a symbol of quiet melody in that harmony. Someone got his own way. <laughs> <laughs> well, General, I think that all of us have had a, a most delightful and I hope enlightened evening uh, tonight. We would so. certainly uh, care to remain for anyone who has more specific inquiries. Uh, but I dare say the two of us standing before the people recognize where the true power must lie. Uh, and simply in representing this dichotomy of political <laughs> economy, which has existed from time immemorial, it is no longer now judged by royalty or monarchy, landed gentry, nobility, uh, or aristocracy. No, our differences of opinion are open now for the future to be judged by whom? The people. And that is why I think as we stand here, they have perhaps a, a rare opportunity to gaze upon the past. But imagine our rare opportunity. We can gaze upon the future. Indeed. I've always said I enjoy much more the dreams of our future than the history of our past. It has frequently been remarked that it seems to be reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example to determine the truly important question whether societies of men are capable or not of establishing good government from are we no more fit for the rain and the spur, or can we indeed govern ourselves? We have fought side by side to make America free. Let us struggle then, hand in hand, to make her happy as well. Your Thank you, Mr. Sir. My pleasure, sir. <laughs>